Good morning. Let's consider this issue from a practical perspective because it's probably more relatable to non-academics, which is most of us. This is a chart showing that China poured more concrete in three years than the United States did over an entire century. We Americans then have more historical experience pouring concrete than China does. We've been doing it for a lot longer, but in a blink, they caught up and then some. So rhetorically speaking, who is more likely to be doing cutting edge research into new applications of concrete? China or someone else? In the years 1900 to 2000, we should assume that almost all the research papers about concrete were written in the English language. But what about now? Here's a couple more. This is a map of China's high-speed rail system in 2008 compared to just 12 years later. That's how much high-speed railroad track was laid in China in 12 years. Here's CNN. Since 2008, China has built 26,000 miles of high-speed rail and they're adding 15,000 more miles of high-speed rail in the next 10 years. In the United States, we have 375 total miles. The same rhetorical questions are here then too. Where is the research being done in the high-speed rail industry? Are those people in the United States or in China? How to build the railroads faster and stronger and more efficiently, going through mountains and under rivers and going across deserts, how to make the materials stronger but lighter, how to provide power sources to the railroad systems. Who is doing all that research? To ask these questions is to answer them. Nobody goes to the United States to learn how to build railroads. So the ones doing the research in high-speed rail are Chinese. The consumers of that research are also Chinese. The engineers and the surveyors and the builders and the equipment makers the industries and the local governments, they're Chinese too. And that's important because that means that the publications are going to be written in the Chinese language for the Chinese audience. And because of that, the research is appearing in journals and publications that we are likely unaware of. But it is impactful research because they're doing the research in the real world today and they will apply it in the real world tomorrow. So those are just two examples picked at random, concrete and high-speed rail. I could have picked a hundred others. For example, 90% of all the electronics in the whole world are built in Guangdong province in South China. So of course, there's a lot of top level research being done in electrical engineering, but written in Chinese for consumers who speak only Chinese, but who take that research to build electronics. And all this represents a serious shortcoming, a blind spot in how we rank universities around the world. Typically, global university rankings include counts of how much research is being done that have a high impact. And those same rankings ignore a lot of the research because it isn't being published in Western journals or often not even in English. Now, though, they're looking at things differently and a good analysis is here. When we are able to move to an open source survey of published work, Chinese universities suddenly take over the tops of the rankings without changing a thing, he says. They aren't doing anything differently. The Chinese universities are still doing research just like before, publishing in the same journals like they were before to be read and applied by Chinese industry just like before. Only difference is that we've agreed to count that research in the world rankings of universities. Leiden University Center for Science and Technology changed their ranking methodologies and simply added open data sources. And doing so flipped everything upside down. Traditionally, rankings were done this way, such as in the Shanghai ranking. Researchers published to the world's top academic journals and those publications are counted up along with cross citations and references. The CWTS Leiden ranking uses OpenAlex, which is an all resource database of scholarly work. And under both ranking systems, the Shanghai ranking and Leiden, Harvard University comes out on top. After Harvard is where everything changes. Zhao Tong University in Shanghai, 
bumps Stanford at number two. Zhejiang University takes the number three spot from MIT. We see six red flags out of the top 10, top nine actually. Six out of the top nine universities in the world ranked by impactful publications in all source are Chinese compared to zero before. Here are the rankings 11 through 20. China's got four more there, so half. 10 of 20 of the top research universities in the world are in China. And the issue is right here, that the most reputed index used by traditional ranking systems is called the SCI, or the Science Citation Index. But SCI is only a small percentage of the work that's published across the world. Critics say that it has a Western bias and that it's too exclusive. SCI includes 9,200 journals compared to OpenAlex, which has over 100,000 journals. Between 2000 and 2009, Chinese researchers published 1 million scientific papers that did not count to their university rankings. But we can see all around us the real world impact that that research has had. This is what we pointed to in the beginning. Researchers estimate that the language mix from Chinese researchers is 50-50 Chinese to English. New research on cutting edge metallurgy for railroads built in extreme climates, for an example. That is much more likely to be written in Chinese or in Russian, come to think of it, and not show up in our databases at all. But that research does have an impact, a real world impact. And so now this research is being counted as scientifically valid and applied to these university rankings. China's got 2.2 million professional scientists and engineers, and the shift in the production of scientific research from the United States to China today is similar to the shift from the UK to the United States in 1948. Coincidentally, 1948 is the year my family came from England to the United States. The shift in global leadership by then was apparent to everyone. The US, compared to the UK, had a lot more money and a lot more people. 1948, there were many tens of millions more Americans than English millions more engineers, scientists, business executives, leaders in industry and in education. And all that education was applied in US industry, which made the United States the factory of the world. Who does that sound like lately? This is Hong Kong. Be good.